So what is your job title? My technical job title is senior associate producer, but on various projects, I will also serve as a producer or a designer. Could you describe your responsibilities? So my responsibilities on a project are normally a little bit of everything. I have to have a hand in all the various parts of development and production. And this this ranges from the scheduling, planning, budgeting type stuff, where I'm doing the boring paperwork. And at Konami, being a producer also involves a lot of creative input. So I might, depending on the project, I might be doing initial designs, concepts, and then obviously working with the developer, overseeing development. And then outside of all those things, I also coordinate with the various departments inside Konami from marketing, PR, customer support, and so on down the line. What is the scope of your influence? So my influence on a project is a mix of whatever I'm assigned to do on the project, and then along with how convincing or annoying I am to other people to convince them to do what I want them to do. Konami, as a company, is basically the sum total of all the different departments, and then on top of that, all the different regions that Konami is in. So, you know, the US, Europe, Japan, etc. So that factors in production, marketing, legal, accounting, sales, all those various things, and then around the world. So I don't control all those departments. It's pretty much just working with them and, and finding what's best for each department. Would you consider yourself the one in charge of the Silent Hill HD collection? No, I was not the person in charge of Silent Hill HD collection. I was in charge of the voice re-recording process. Due to my history doing localization and a lot of voice recording, I was kind of the person that knew most about it. So this involved finding a studio to do it at, hiring a director, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, preparing scripts, casting, feedback, all that sort of thing. So that's kind of where my direct influence started and ended on HD collection. Who is Devin Shatsky? Devin Shatsky is a producer, which means he's technically above me. But on projects that we're both really involved in, it's more like we're working together. So on Downpour, we both had sort of a similar impact on the project, though he'd have final say on things. For example, like on Book of Memories, I'm the producer, so he's not involved as much. Why do you think you're being singled out instead of Devin and others in similar positions by Silent Hill fans? It's kind of obvious why I'm being singled out is because I'm the one that's speaking most often about the franchise. You know, a lot of that has to do with if marketing can only send one person to a marketing event. I'm working on multiple Silent Hill projects, and if Devin's only working on one Silent Hill project, it makes more sense to send me because I can talk about all of them. So that just results in me saying the most and people seeing me the most, and so they decide I'm the guy who's responsible. What would you say is your rank in the company? Like, if the president of Konami was number one, where are you? (laughs) (laughs) It's not ranked like that uh, at all. There's plenty of people above me, producers, directors, VPs, the president. And that goes for every department and every region of Konami around the world. So I'm nowhere near the top. How many people worked on the HD collection and downpour? Uh, Well, if you take a look at the game's credits, that's about how many people worked on the game. You are considered the franchise's public face. Are you more connected with the PR side or the development side? I'm definitely more on the development side, pretty clearly. I can make suggestions regarding marketing, sales, PR, packaging, but I don't make any of the final decisions on those things. The reason that I try to be involved in interviews and and PR and stuff is because somebody has to do that. Somebody has to talk about the game. And as a gamer growing up, I always didn't like when... You know, you'd read like, oh, it's a cool new interview about this game. And then, you know, you open the magazine or click on the link to see it. And it's basically a PR person reading off bullet points from a spreadsheet they have. Like, oh, this is why people want to play the game. It's got RPG battle system and it's multiplayer. And I guess that's it. You know, it's not their job to know, like, the intricacies of development and how this all came about. But I think that's more interesting to hear about. And journalists always ask questions like, why did Downpour switch to the Unreal Engine? And what challenges does that bring to the series? Or, you know, how is it working on the Vita? And things like that, that a PR marketing person can't answer. They're not involved in that. It doesn't mean that shouldn't be answered. It's interesting to people. So if I'm there, I can answer those things. So I try to be involved so that people can get more information instead of, you know, stuff they've already read in a news story before. And then, as I said before, I work a little bit on every Silent Hill, so I'm kind of the guy if they're going to have random questions about lore or switch from Book of Memories to a downpour question, I'm going to know the answer to that. So it's kind of better I'm involved than not involved. Devin came to Silent Hill, and then he'd played a little of it before, but he more delved into it after he got assigned to it, whereas I've been playing it since 1999. So I saw all that lore as a gamer and figured out all the lore behind the town and did all that research for years and years and years and years. So... I'm going to know it off the top of my head, where if Devin has a question, maybe he's not quite sure, he misspeaks, and then he ends up on a Twin Perfect video, 
you know, and they're trying to say, oh, you shouldn't be working on Silent Hill, da 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 da. So that's why I'm involved a lot in the PR. Are you capable of watching over and controlling every aspect of a Silent Hill game, from script writing, coding, art direction, etc.? No, it's not possible for me to simultaneously control every aspect of a game. Basically how it works is, you know, if we're working with a the developer, they'll have a producer or a designer that I directly interface with, and then their company's broken down into, you know, each department has a lead, and they're in charge of what that department does. So mostly it's me interfacing with my counterpart at that company. And then, you know, it's, it's their job to worry about each person in their company. So if I get a build and I make a suggestion, then it sort of filters through the appropriate people. And they can do it, or they can send me a better suggestion, or we, we work together. It's not like a dictatorship where I demand certain things and they have to jump and go do them. It's kind of a trust thing. If Konami and the developer are working together to make this game for Konami, I'm sort of Konami's communication point to the developer. Are you in charge of choosing which development studio gets to make the next Silent Hill game, or is that a decision from higher up? Are you also in charge of the game's genre? No, the decision about which developer to use is above my pay grade. I did, however, advocate WayForward for Contra 4, which we did some years ago, and Book of Memories, because they're a really good developer for old school gameplay, which is what both of those games called for. Depending on the game, the genre can be decided by many different people. It's really just a matter of, you know, what's the game and who's involved with creating it. Where does Silent Hill rank in popularity compared to the other franchises Konami owns? Stuff like Dance Dance Revolution, Metal Gear, Castlevania, Suikoden, Beatmania, and Contra. Do you think Silent Hill's popularity has an effect on Konami's decisions regarding its handling? Franchises aren't exactly ranked like that. But obviously Silent Hill is more on the niche side with a smaller, very dedicated fan base, but smaller. And obviously the number of customers for a Metal Gear Solid is exponentially larger than a Silent Hill. And so the more people that are for sure going to buy a game, the more money that game has to play with. You said before on a forum, quote, because what the cool kids who get it misunderstand is the reason those beer chugging space marines didn't get into Silent Hill 2 was because the only thing worse than the voice acting was the shit controls and brainless combat. Was this sarcasm? Yeah, that was a facetious or I guess you could say in character statement for the type of gamer I was speaking of. And what I was trying to get at with this was what I thought was a common experience, but maybe it's unusual is where Silent Hill fans try to get their other gamer friends who aren't into survival horror or adventure games or things like that to play Silent Hill. Because we all love them very much, and they're unique, and we want other people to experience them because they'd enjoy them too. And I've heard about this from a lot of different gamers that they've done this with Silent Hill. So my point about this was, when we did that 10 years ago, the type of games those people played, when compared to Silent Hill 2, Silent Hill was kind of lacking in key areas that they looked for in a game, and that might have turned them off. We all know those things aren't the point of Silent Hill. It's not about like quick shooting and sniping and all these things. That's not the point of the game. But the gamers like that really want that type of game. That's what the mainstream gamers were all about. And so if the rest of Silent Hill wasn't up to their standards, they wouldn't look past them and see what we loved about them. They wouldn't get into the story because they didn't like the voice acting. Or they thought the gameplay was really slow and clunky. And so they didn't want to spend four hours playing it because they could spend those four hours playing multiplayer Halo or something. That was the general idea of my statement, was with the nicer HD presentation of HD Collection, those players wouldn't have those roadblocks anymore. And you could finally get that type of player to sort of see why you loved this game and why this game meant so much to you. You've also said, with HD Collection, you may finally be able to get your Halo-chugging buddies to enjoy fine digital storytelling. Could you tell us what you meant by this? Similar to what I said before, I was trying to refer to more niche game fans trying to convince their more mainstream fans to try these games that they thought they'd appreciate or understand. It's important to note that the forum that I made these statements on is a forum I was a frequent poster on for five years. So my audience for these comments already knew like my views and my loyalties. And nobody who read these at any point said, oh my gosh, Tom hates Silent Hill. This is terrible because they all know who I am and which games I love. In my understanding, when Twin Perfect used these quotes in their documentary, they edited out the line from these posts where I said directly, Silent Hill 2 is in my top three games of all time. And earlier in the thread, I'd also mentioned that it was my favorite Silent Hill game, and I listed them in order of my preference. So there's no confusion in context what I meant by these quotes. Personally, I think it's unprofessional and kind of cowardly to doctor quotes to that degree, just to prove a point, and to remove all context from the forum. You've said, Nobody cares about Silent Hill more than I do. Not hyperbole. Literally, nobody. What did you mean? I'm sure the statement was in response to something, but I don't really remember what it was. But I definitely still feel that way. 
sort of where I'm coming from is, obviously when the games came out, I played them, and I bought every Silent Hill on release day. You know, I, I understand fans love Silent Hill a lot. A lot of fans love other games too, Zelda, MGS, Resident Evil. So they kind of split their fandom between things. They also have school or jobs that they're, you know, when you're at school, you're not thinking about Silent Hill, you're thinking about school. And when you're at your job, you're thinking about doing your job. But then as the person working on Silent Hill, that is my job. And I take that really seriously. I'm thinking about Silent Hill pretty much 24-7. At work, I'm thinking about Silent Hill. When I'm playing new games, I'm comparing them to Silent Hill. I think about Silent Hill while I'm walking the dog, which is pretty much where I conceptualize all the Book of Memory story, actually. When my wife and I are having a nice dinner, I'm bugging her with Silent Hill talk. I'm kind of the constant, never-ending Silent Hill engine all the time. And as an example, when HD Collection came out, I was on sick leave because my wife had major surgery, so I was at home to take care of her. And when the game came out and I heard about all the issues in it, I spent time that I should have been taking care of my wife playing the retail copy to actually see what these problems were that made it in the game and then try to get them addressed. Now, obviously, my wife gave me permission to do that because I'm not stupid, but that's sort of my dedication to the franchise. To your knowledge, did Konami already own the voices for Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3? Is it not that simple? Without getting too into it, Konami definitely owned the voices. And like I said, someone wanted to involve the old actors out of goodwill. And our initial plan was to have both original and new voices. If Guy Sehe and the other Silent Hill 2 voice actors did not sign away their rights in the end, would Konami have released the HD collection without the old voices? Legally, they could have released the games with the original voices, but out of respect to the actors, they would have chosen not to. Did Konami attempt to contact Heather Morris during the development of the HD collection? Yes, for several months. Do you know whose idea it was to reunite the cast of Silent Hill 2 for the signing away of the voice rights? In the end, uh, it was Jeremy Blaustein who kind of got everyone together and on the same page and made the whole voice thing happen. Are you a programmer? No, I'm not a programmer at all. I took a couple classes in high school, so I kind of know how programming works, but I can't code or do anything like that. To paraphrase Twin Perfect, on whose authority are you, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, Troy Baker, etc., able to make creative changes to Silent Hill 2? So some important things that need to be understood before this question has a clear answer is anything that someone does in working for Konami is owned by Konami. If the people called Team Silent are just Konami employees, like me or Devin or various other people, and they gave themselves an unofficial name, just like we said Team Silence in reference to them. They're not an external developer like Vatra, but even still, if an external developer does something for Konami, that's also owned by Konami. And then, if an employee, any work they do in video games while at Konami, belongs to Konami. So, if I think of a cool game idea on the clock, and then I get a different job somewhere else, legally, technically, I can't make that game, because I thought of it at Konami, and it belongs to Konami. And this is not just a Konami thing, this is industry-wide, EA, Capcom, Nintendo, Rockstar, anywhere. The employees that work there make something. It belongs to that company. It's the company's property. So everyone knows it. To work somewhere, they all agree to it. It's not a surprise to anybody. So the owner and creator of Silent Hill is Konami. There were a bunch of different people that made it then. There's a bunch of the people who made it after them. There's a bunch of people that make it now. Konami owns it. So I had the authority to change the voices because my boss assigned me the task as a Konami employee. And then I gave Mary Elizabeth authority by hiring her as the voice director, because she's a good voice director. And then I guess Troy had authority to be James because she cast him. And then Mary supervises Troy, and I supervise Mary, and Devin supervises me, and our boss supervises him, and his boss, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So video game development works like any other job anywhere. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, if Konami asks somebody different than me to take downpour and, like, make the true Silent Hill downpour where Sewell is the main character, and the plot's totally different, I don't have to like it. I probably wouldn't, but it doesn't belong to me. It's Konami's game. It's not Tom Hewlett's game. It's the game I made for Konami. So that's sort of how authority works. When a game is in development, how often are you physically in the dev studio checking up on everything? My physical involvement at a studio kind of depends on the game and where the developer's located. In general, I get as many builds from them as possible. Builds are are the current state of the game, so I can play it and give feedback to them. And on on top of that, we normally have a weekly call, so I'm at least speaking to them every week. I prefer to do it that way. But for example, with Silent Hill Downpour, which obviously a very important main entry in the series, I spent over three months in the Czech Republic, for example, in 2011 on site at Vatra. And then Devin did the same thing. So, you know, we were there half the year, basically. In regards to the HD collection, do you know if there was any other studios considered for the port before Hijinx was brought on? I actually have no idea. I was not involved in that decision. 
Were you satisfied with the QA done for the HD collection? I was very disappointed with how many bugs made it through in the final version of HD collection. Obviously, every single game has bugs that slip through due to budget and time and all those things, but we all know it's not usually to this degree, so that was unfortunate. Were you the man in charge of making the decisions to recast the voice actors and rewrite the script, or were those orders from higher up? I was assigned to the task to recast the voice acting, obviously partially due to my history with Atlas and doing localizations, as well as Shattered Memories and other things for Konami, and well, we did not rewrite the script. Mary Elizabeth McGlynn has claimed that you rewrote the entire script of Silent Hill 2, possibly Silent Hill 3 as well. Could you tell us more about this? Yeah, so I think this is a misunderstanding. You know, when an actor reads a line, they really want it to match the lip flap and look natural. Because otherwise, it looks like they did a bad performance, even though their performance might be fine, but the on-screen graphics make it look weird. Normally, when you're doing a localization, you match the lip flap. So if a line's written as don't, you might change it to do not, or vice versa. It's not changing any words or meaning. It's just making it more natural for them to speak and the way it's animated. So for things like this where it's already been animated, you want it to fit since you're looking directly at it. It's not someone animating it later. So we looked at things like this, and then as well as critical errors like the despoiled line which means the opposite of what it was intended to mean. And then when we found out we were unable to alter the subtitles at all, um, suddenly you can't do the, like, don't, do not thing. Because then each and every one of them would be really obvious looking. Because if you're reading along and then they say the other one, then it's just as bad a performance as if it didn't totally match the lip flap. Then when we were recording them, we were able to sort of fill in those timing gaps with performance, like breathing or things like that to make it sound natural. So we still hopefully kept the good lip flap without slightly changing any of the lines. But I wanted to keep in things like the despoiled fix, as well as Heather's kill you, because I felt strongly about those. And again, I discussed them with Jeremy Blaustein, who wrote them initially, and he felt they were good changes. So that's why those are there. Did you have anything to do with the new portrayal of the happy birthday caller in Silent Hill 3? Do you feel the caller had or has dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder? So when you're in the studio, actors try different reads that they kind of like or they have an idea. And this was the result of a read an actor tried, and several other people really liked it. And we're already in this project where you couldn't change any lines, everything has to be this way. It's already these scenes that are pre-animated. And so some people thought, let's give the actor some freedom here, this is kind of a cool read. So I kind of went with popular opinion on that one. I wouldn't necessarily do it again, but that's what we did. We don't really for sure know who that character is, necessarily. Obviously a lot of people kind of assume he's Stanley, but he says he's not, and... He's the creepy happy birthday guy. So he probably has a lot of different things wrong with him. He's in an asylum. Did you consider other Silent Hill games for the HD collection? Obviously, when you're making a game, every game has its own set schedule and budget that's assigned to it. And HD collection was delayed at least once, obviously from the change in release date. So I'm not really sure we could have fit more than two games into this project. Did fan demand lead to Konami approving an Xbox 360 release for the HD collection, or was it already in the works? We'd been considering an Xbox port for some time internally, and obviously the level of demand helped that process along, sort of helped make it happen. But by level of demand, I mean the amount of interested players and nice recent emails we received about why they'd be interested in purchasing it on Xbox and all these things. I do not mean angry rants or videos, because those don't really accomplish anything. Was Sato Works contacted to gain access to Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3's original files for cinematics? As far as I know, Sato Works is just Sato-san, but I don't know that for sure. I don't really have details, but that's the impression I've always gotten. And when he stopped working for Konami, he probably left those files with Konami, because that's who owned them. So since Konami didn't utilize those files to re-render higher resolution cinematics for the HD collection, it's likely that they've been lost or destroyed? Yep. Why do the cinematics in the HD collection appear to be washed out? I don't really know. If I had to guess, I would guess that it has something to do with the fact they were rendered at lower resolution initially. And so without original data to rebuild them, they can't be re-rendered at the appropriate size. But that's not the 100% technical word on it. That's just my guess. Was the TV border for Silent Hill 2's videotape scene part of the original Silent Hill 2 files? I have no idea where that came from. And I was kind of sad when I saw it. The HD collection took two years to make. Was that the original time frame expected of the project? I'm not really at liberty to discuss time frames or delays or anything like that. However, when we learned the state of the source code, it became this much larger task than anticipated. Did fan pressure during the Silent Hill 2 voice acting debacle have anything to do with its resolution? As far as the voice debacle, I guess, the fan petitions and things didn't really have much of an impact. 
this was something we'd wanted to do all along. So we were kind of at a dead end. There wasn't much we could do. And at that point, Jeremy Blaustein came in and did a bunch of the legwork to make it possible and make it happen. So if there's one single person you want to credit with the original voice mode, that would be Jeremy. In hiring new voice actors for Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3, did you purposefully go for voice actors that would provide a new take on the character? Our goal in our our casting process for the new voices was purely to actors who would bring out the essence of each character. So the only consideration we had in casting was how the character was written. We didn't take into account the original performance because we didn't want mimics or voice matches. We wanted actual performances as the character. Twin Perfect brought up Thessaly Lerner's out-of-court settlement for the reusage of her voice in Silent Hill 3. If Guy Sihi were legally in the right, wouldn't Konami have done the exact same thing in this case and just get it all over with? The two claims being compared, Silent Hill 3 and then Guy Sihi for HD Collection, they're actually not the same at all. Uh, The reason that Lisa's voice, they ruled it had to be removed from SH3, was because she'd recorded that performance for SH1. So SH3 is a totally different product and they were using the same voice and not paying her for working on a new product. Collections of games are the same product as they were initially. So this is still Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3. So any agreements made for those or any performances, the same usage applies. It's just like porting SH2 to PC or Xbox. It's just porting it to PS3 and Xbox 360, basically. If we had tried to, say, use Monica as Maria in Downpour, that would be the same as the Silent Hill 3 case. But we weren't using it in Downpour. We were just collecting these two games and then reporting them in a re-release. Technical and logistical reasons were cited as being the cause of Silent Hill 3's lack of old vocal performances. Can you expound on that? Was it because of the rights of the Tuvon throat singing? What? Uh, I can't go into detail about the exact things involved, or I would have when I made that original statement. But it had nothing to do with Heather Morris and finding or not finding her. It was totally unrelated. What? What about throat singing? Did Twin Perfect attempt to contact you at all for comment for the HD Collection video they made? No, they never contacted me in any way. Is it possible Twin Perfect's videos actually harmed the negotiations between Konami and Silent Hill 2's original voice actors during the HD Collection's creation? Twin Perfect's videos, if anything, only fanned fires of drama, pretty much. Corporations do not respond at all to drama. They didn't really contribute. If anything, they were a negative influence. And She Sells Seashells video actually did provide some much-needed levity during the Book of Memories voiceover session. Do you feel that Twin Perfect's videos have contributed to Silent Hill fans' anger toward you? Absolutely. They're pretty much the primary source of all the anger, I think. Now, obviously, I understand gamers, being one, I understand that they want as much information or answers as possible about the games they like, the games they hate, whatever. They're fans of the industry, so they like knowing these things. And due to how the game industry works, there's not a lot of information. You know, it's kind of controlled. Here's an interview by this person for this product. You don't have access to all these insider things. Then there's these two guys on a couch, and they're talking, and they seem pretty confident in the answers they're providing. So people kind of latch onto that. Like, that makes sense. I understand how that happens. The problem is, as far as I know, they don't have any experience in or knowledge of the game industry. So everything they say is just speculation or their opinions or anger they have over various things. So people latch onto that, and pretty much the speculation of how or why things happen is 100% inaccurate. Now, every time they release a new video, I get a swell of hate mail and threats. I can't really comment on a forum anymore or make a blog post without a bunch of angry comments on it, which is frustrating. These range from death threats. There's a lot of, I hope they fire you. I've been called a fraud. I also get a bunch of insults directed at Mary, which is reprehensible and shameful. The problem is, this is exactly what Twin Perfect wants. They're basically TMZ. They want the drama, and that sort of sustains what they're trying to do. They make more videos to make more drama. The problem is, the people that they are attacking, we're not movie stars. We're not trading in our own reputation. We're not trying to be the center of attention. We're just people doing our jobs. Now, they're cool jobs, and they're jobs we really love, and we're passionate about on projects we love. But if things get too intense, we don't have million-dollar mansions to hide in. We don't have high-tech security systems. We're just people. So Twin Perfect is basically like TMZ following your dad around the office, trying to get scandals. Do you still get hate for the work that you did on the Silent Hill series? Yeah, I still get hate. Um, It has slowed down a little bit very recently, like maybe in the last six months. Um, Right now it takes the form uh, usually of like some smartass on Twitter will like make a comment. Well, I'll, I'll tweet something like totally unrelated to Silent Hill and they'll be like, Oh, well, like in Silent Hill, right? 
Um, and it's really hard to tell if, if it's like someone trying to good naturedly joke or if it's someone trying to like get in their two cents. Usually it seems like it's the two cents thing, which is frustrating. And then I'll, you know, I'll get private messages on Facebook and, and, uh, Twitter about it, or I'll see it on, uh, a video, you know, um, I made a Goosebumps game a couple years ago. People might not know this, but when you make a game, you really want to know what people think of it. <laughs> so I was watching a, a blind Let's Play um, shortly after it came out, and the guy was like, he was super into it. He's picking up all the fan service. He's like, this is so good. Like, I wasn't expecting it to be this good. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much Goosebumps in it. It's so great. And so then he gets to the credits, and it says, like, directed by Tom Hewlett. And he's like, oh, that's that's the Silent Hill guy. And then, you know, a couple minutes later, the credits finish and he's he's doing his like final thoughts on Goosebumps. And he's like, well, yeah, it wasn't really that good. There wasn't a lot of fan service. You know, it was disappointing overall. It was like, dude, I watched three hours of this and you were loving it. And then you saw my name and suddenly it's like subpar like that. Come on. Like I I saw you react in real time. You mentioned the hate has died down recently. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I've been away from Konami for over five years, and I tweet every year so people remember, like, like it has been a very long time since I worked there. This thing that you're mad at happened almost a year before I left, and you're still mad about it. And a lot of things have gone down since then with the company and with higher profile people than me at said company. So I'd like to think that maybe people are sort of thinking it through or, like, understanding the game industry more and being like, oh, you know, Tom couldn't have made this by himself. That's crazy. But then... Every time I think that someone will talk about Silent Hill in a thread or on Twitter, and I'll be like, oh, hey, you know, we're talking about Silent Hill. And then someone will jump in and be like, well, have you seen the real Silent Hill experience? Here's a link. This will change your mind about the whole thing. And it's like, that video is so old. And people are still discovering it, which is the magic of the internet. But it's like reopening old wounds or like finding people who have just now found the series and trying to like indoctrinate them. It's really frustrating. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's probably doing more damage now because. Back then, when the series was active, and it was a lot of longtime fans, you know, they already had their own opinions, and so they were merging, like, what Twin Perfect was saying with, like, what they thought already, and sort of coming to a middle ground. But now, if you if they're just now discovering it, they're probably new fans, or they played them a long time ago, and maybe they see, like, oh, this one came out ten years ago, and like, oh, I should replay that and get into it. And then they're seeing this information new, and so they don't have a lot of stuff to... Uh, leveraged against and so to them this is like oh while i was gone these people found out the truth and this guy sucks and that's an easy way if you if you've only played one or two or you only or you you know you played one you liked it there's a guy on twitter recently who's been tweeting me and he, he just played homecoming that's his first entry into the series which good because it only goes up from there but for him it's like oh well if he if he just wanted to know about the franchise and he typed in like silent hill full series or something that would come up and that would be his exposure to like the games he hadn't played and that sucks. Like, you shouldn't, that should, no one's first exposure to any of the games should be that documentary. Like, they, they should play them, and then maybe they stumble across it later. You gotta have that personal perspective first. Are you familiar when Two Best Friends Play referenced you? Since I'm not working on it, I try not to go out of my way to watch Silent Hill things, because it usually ends up this way. But when they did that, I had a bunch of people at work like, hey dude, like, Two Best Friends mentioned you, like, they hate you. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know who those people are at the time. I mean, I know who they are now, but it's like, what? What? Why? What's happening? <laughs> the worst, the worst uh, series of fan hates, I guess. So um, this is years ago, five years ago, maybe. I was no longer at Konami, but I hadn't been gone very long. And, you know, Facebook had that thing where people could message you and you wouldn't see it. And you had to go searching for, like, these messages they hid from you. So I was at a friend's wedding and somebody pointed out, like, oh, Facebook has this thing. And I was like, oh, I should check that out. I've never looked at it there. So we get back to the hotel, and I'm just messing around on the computer. And so I opened it up, and it's there were like, I don't remember the exact number, let's say 96, somewhere in the in the 90s. Messages about Silent Hill dating back to when like Shattered Memories was before it came out, when it was having trailers and stuff. And so I thought, oh man, these people messaged me years ago, and they never got a response, and I look like a dick. So... For some reason, I was like, I should respond to all of these messages tonight. We just were at a wedding all day, and my wife is asleep in the hotel. And I'm, like, on the computer messaging these people, like, oh, hey, you know, sorry I didn't see this message before, but I hope you like Shattered Memories, like you seemed really excited about it. Or, you know, hopefully you played Downpour and we didn't disappoint you or whatever. And so then I got all of them replying. And so some of them 
had flip-flopped both ways. So some people were like, I hate you and everything you're doing. And then like, oh man, thanks for messaging me back. Like, you know, I, I know I researched this more and like, you don't seem like such a bad guy. And, you know, thanks so much. But then there were a bunch of people that were like, I was looking forward to that and you ruined it. And I hate you now. And I saw this video and it told me all about you and you're bad. So that was a frustrating, like, that's my pattern of like, I'm going to try to do this nice thing because it, it seems like the right thing to do. And I'm going to respond to all these people. And then it blew up in my face because like, oh, this is, this is more depressing than not. <laughs> it's, it's frustrating because like as a creator, you want to get better. You want to know what people think or don't like or how people reacted to your work. So I don't know. I mean, you have to go seek it out and see what they're saying. But then if everyone's first reaction is to hate everything, that's not constructive either. Like, you know, if some review hated uh, a combat mechanic and they were like, you know, this combat mechanic didn't work. And like, I think they were trying to do this and it didn't come through. And I ended up sticking to this weapon and just doing this repeatedly. And that wasn't fun. Like, that's useful. And you're like, oh, shoot. Why? You know, you can examine the game and think, well, well, why didn't they get this? Or was why wasn't it coming across? Or why would that weapon work and the other ones didn't? You know. There's a lot of info there, even though it seems it seems pretty bare bones feedback wise. It's actually there's a ton buried there for a game designer. But if everyone's just like this game sucks and everyone who made it is bad and should feel bad, there's nothing usable there. You know, even if they have legitimate things, I don't know what they are. You hear about other creators getting this hate like constantly now, <laughs> and and it's not just games. It's obviously like people seem to have opinions on Star Wars and whatnot. It's just really depressing because, you know, it's not even like they're trying to find the person responsible. They're trying to find like a person they can name and target. There's all sorts of examples, and I'm not sure I want to name them because people that are mad at that, I don't want them to get mad at me. <laughs> That's why I'm going to stick to Star Wars instead of games. Um, but like people going after Ryan Johnson, like, OK, sure. Like he wrote and directed it. He, he's again, movies are made by hundreds, if not thousands of people. But if you want to target one guy for some reason, like he seems like a reasonable target, right? But then they're like, oh, well, this actress played this character that I don't think should be in the movie, so I'm going to attack her. Like, what? Are you are you serious? Like, all she did was like get cast in a dream job and then did her best. And if you don't like that the character was there, that's not her fault. And if you don't like the lines she said, like, that's not her fault. <laughs> so it's just crazy that people are, are doing this. And then, I don't know, it, it also seems so petty to complain about games because we have like, people doing political hits on creative people and that seems so much bigger and makes stuff i went through seem petty but um it's just a thing right now and i think it's ridiculous people shouldn't you know if you really hate something creative just go after the work don't go after the people and then you know convince your friends not to pay money for it and then you know maybe that'll make a difference but chasing people off twitter is stupid and horrible so yeah no matter what you think um that person didn't target you and want to ruin your game or your movie or your childhood they didn't do that they don't know who you are like they you know who they are and you're trying to hurt them that's a that's a bad thing and what they did even if they somehow did destroy your childhood which is insane but even if they did do that it was accidental because they were doing something totally unrelated to you so there's no reason to then target them and try to hurt them that's makes you the villain and that's a terrible don't don't be terrible people be better people (laughs) one one aspect of the konami thing that that people don't realize is uh, my wife was the head of customer support so if people sent angry death threats to konami you weren't really sending them to me i I didn't see a lot of them i was just told they existed um you were sending them to my wife so if you have a loved one and you can imagine them having to hear about the petty nonsense you're mad about like that's that's pretty terrible (laughs) and so again like if the goal was to psychologically scare me or whatever, that wasn't happening, but you were like hurting my wife. So, you know, again, it's pointless to target someone, but like people don't understand how messages get anywhere. So, you know, I I think a lot of them don't even think I saw anything. They were just sending them into the void to like blow off some steam. So then it's like, well, Tom's like a game designer. He's not going to see my email. That's dumb. But my wife saw your email and you were writing about her husband and all the stuff you wanted to happen to him. So that's, you know, sure, I didn't see it, but only because my wife saw it. So that sucks. When I went to the Silent Hill Revelation 3D uh, movie premiere, my wife didn't want to be seen on the red carpet with me because she didn't want Silent Hill fans to know what she looked like. You know, it's the only time I'll walk a red carpet and I didn't get to do it with my wife because of angry death threats. So... Not fun. Thank you.